This is where I live. Um, the mountain range up there uh, burned in 2011. Um, not all of it. That is the rim of a volcano. And my house is deep in those woods. You can't see it. It's buried in all of that. So today's discussion was going to be about smoke and communication. So this is the first thing I'd like to, to us all get straight. Um, my uh, youngest is a, um, taking geometry right now, and I was uh, uh, struck by the thought that uh, since I was supposed to talk about smoke today, and I normally talk about fire, how it relates, and of course we have the old adage where there's smoke, there's fire, but you can also think of it from a mathematical point of view, if that makes you comfortable, that if there's smoke, then fire. The converse is also true. If there's fire, then there is smoke. It's a, it's a biconditional statement. And I'm going to use that for the rest of the talk today. As I said, I tend to talk to people a lot about fire, but I haven't talked to them about smoke. So. You'll see me sort of crossing off the word fire and me using it sort of interchangeably. Um, except in this particular slide where I'd like to point out that we use fire kind of as the verb, as in burning. Smoke is sort of the result here. But if you, I, this is a list of things that I thought about fire, one of which is that um, it's really necessary for ecosystems. I think all of you realize that it's part of our ecosystems. I grew up in Nebraska. I recognize that fire is what keeps a prairie from having trees. And it's necessary if you want a, if you want a prairie. Um, our, I didn't recognize it when I moved to New Mexico, but our forests are also fire adaptive. From a human point of view, we also have spent a lot, it's our greatest accomplishment, isn't it? We sort of say that that's what got civilization started. We control fire, we use it, we use it to heat, and, um, um, we use it to cook, uh, we enjoy it. Uh, how many of you have fireplaces? <laughs> Do you like sitting in front of them on a winter day? I, I particularly enjoy fire, I like watching it. Um, we don't particularly like it when it does those uncomfortable things to us. And so then we talk about controlling fire. Um, so I'd like to speak to you a little bit about controlling fire. This is fundamentally the only way to control fire. It, I'm a chemist by trade, um, and there are the three, the fire triangle, I think you've all heard about it. It has fuel, ignition, and oxygen. We can manage the fuels. We can get more of it. We can get less of it. If you'll notice, I crossed out burning because if you burn it, you get smoke. So if you're not, if you really wanted to control smoke, I guess you're not going to burn fuel. Um, I don't think you can limit the oxygen, and I don't think we want to in our system. All of us won't be here. And the last thing is, is ignition that we tend to limit with regard to the fire triangle. And I'd like to propose to you that I don't think we've done a very good job of really limiting ignitions. In fact, I don't think we've done a very good job at all. I think we have ignitions all the time. I think they're everywhere, and I think they can occur constantly. What I do think is that we rush in and put out fire once we see them. So this is literally off the web. Um, the Bitterroot National Forest in Montana, they had a picture of 40-year uh, increments of a, one particular view. The first one you can see quite far in the distance. The second one, 40 years later, we're getting a little bit of fill in, especially in the back. And of course, in 1989, you, prob you probably need a machete to get through it. 
Can anyone tell me what you think it will look like in 2028? I could tell you what I think it's going to look like. I think it's going to look like match stitch. Fire's coming. So I was privileged to literally have a front row seat to both of these particular fires. Sierra Grande uh, fire occurred in 2000, and I had a house in the woods right above it and watched it happen. Um, in 2011, it repeated itself 11 years later in the Lost Conscious fire. And so if you say that all it takes is it for it to burn once, here is proof that you have two catastrophic events basically overrunning the same area. There are ignitions everywhere, and you're not going to be able to control them. And so the only thing left of that fire triangle, guys, is that you can control the fuels. You're not going to control the ignitions, and you're not controlling the oxygen. All that's left are the fuels. So let's talk about a little bit of communication. When I sat down to think about it, it's you guys are telling me a message, and I'm listening. I think it's the simplest form of that. Um, and as a public member, I'm not really able to give you feedback very easily. I'm sitting in my uh, living room, I get it on the television, and what are my natural responses to any message that can be told to me? And I will propose to you that if government or agencies or people are telling me falsehoods, lies, or just mistakes, I stop listening. If it's true and it's pertinent to me, I may pay attention. I think that's generally for all of us. If it's not very important to you, do you pay much attention to it? So let's discuss what I think smoke is not. These are some of the misconceptions I think that, that are out there. The first one being that smoke, or if you will, fire is unpredictable. I think it's eminently predictable. Um, I think that it's coming. Do you want me to predict when and where? It's where I light the match, the lightning strike happens. It's where there's fuel, oxygen, and ignition. And so when you tell me that, oh, there's nothing to do, um, you might as well throw up your hands and give up. I stop listening. I stop listening, because I know better. I know that it's predictable. Next one, global warming. This one really, when I hear uh, the California fires and politicians get up and tell me that fires cause because the Earth's getting warmer, um, I basically turn off the TV and walk out of the room. I start pacing, and I start probably telling my husband all sorts of, you know, weird things about how we should fire the, these guys. I know that fire is caused by oxygen, ignition, and fuel. And if you're going to tell me that the fact that we have a great deal of fuel is because the Earth's warmer, how many of you believe that? Okay, so when you insist upon it, I get more and more angry. Next one, I used to believe this one. When I moved to New Mexico, I thought that you could get rid of fire. They told me so. They would control all burns, that it's, you just have the firefighters come and put it out. I no longer believe this. This one, I don't believe, but I did at one point. The last one isn't so much what we need to deal with, but in, in the WUI, if you will, in the insurance companies, there, if there is an implication that if we just pay more, if we have more insurance, then I guess we'll all be okay. So my apologies to the Air Quality Bureau. I picked on you guys. 
Um, this is off their website. It says that their mission uh, is to protect the inhabitants and natural beauty of, Mex of New Mexico by preventing the deterioration of air quality. And when I'm as a public here, that you're going to protect and prevent um, this particular exercise, um, I don't believe you can. Now, I do agree that I wish you could. I really do wish you could. But I really don't believe that you have that power to do so. And I would point out that if you're somebody with a health issue who does believe this, they're going to feel very betrayed when you fail. And, and I think it's a losing proposition. I think you're setting yourself up for, for losing at that point. The rest of us that don't really have health issues, um, and we hear this kind of statement, we just sort of stop listening and we don't pay attention, even if you've got something good to say that needs saying. So I wanted to tell you, I've been busy in the last three weeks or so. I've asked people that I know, people um, that I don't know, what they think about smoke. And so this has been my informal poll. I asked a very good friend of mine who has some very difficult smoke issues. She says she gets it. She doesn't, she knows you guys need to burn. She knows that there's going to be fires even if you don't burn. What she wants is notification that it's coming. Then she can do something to help herself and mitigate. I spoke to another friend of mine and asked, well, you know, what she thought of smoke. And she said, well, why do you guys burn in the windy conditions all the time? All right? When you talk to people out there and they ask you questions like that, they're telling you something. I don't understand why you're doing it. And I don't know if I understand perfectly either, but you're not having the conversation. A third gentleman, I asked what he thought of smoke, and he said, you know, it's just the waste. You know, we used to be able to go out and get wood out of the forest, but now they're just, they're just going to destroy all of that. And so obviously he doesn't understand either what's going on. But I did find that most people out there get it, at least in New Mexico, that it's going to burn. So, if you will note, there are no pictures up here of it not burning. And these are our choices. These are the types of choices we've got right now. We can do, some of them, if you note, we don't ask for permission. The catastrophic ones, we don't ask for permission, and I really wish you guys could have outlawed it, made it not happen, but it does. We also don't ask for permission to burn in our wood-burning stoves. At least I don't. I burn a lot during the winter. Um, some of these are more convenient. Some of them require a lot of hard work to get managed. Some of them you have to transport. There are all sorts of issues. But these are the, these are the problems we're really dealing with. So. It's sort of a conclusion. I think you guys have a possibility of affecting the rate of the burn, how fast it's going to go up in smoke. I also think you might have a chance of affecting how complete the burn's going to be, and complete combustion or not. From there on, if you don't communicate with us with, with, to your best ability with truthful statements, you're going to lose us. We don't believe after a while. And I, I don't know if you would be agree, but I do think that all of us are reasoning and thinking at, uh, beings and that you're going to have to use good arguments with us um, in order to change our opinions and you need to listen in response. 
Now, the really sad news is that those people that don't care right now aren't listening anyway. All right? And you only have a little window of opportunity for when they do start caring. I have one, uh, I guess, question I'd like to ask you. I was thinking about this particular talk, and um, I was thinking, you know, those that bitter root uh, national forest, I'll bet you somebody in here or somewhere around the nation could probably estimate how much biomass has been grown on a typical one acre of unburned forest somewhere in this country. And if you take all that forest in, say, the state of New Mexico, I bet you could estimate how much biomass needs to burn to get back to 100 years ago. And I'd also like to ask, then, how, if you were to burn one-tenth of it every year, how much smoke would you need to put in the air to get back to 100 years ago? I think you can estimate that. At any rate, on that cheery note, <laughs>